Devaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Agyanta Mrdanda Shajananjana Shalakaya, Chakshura Manitam Jena Tasmai Shri Guru Vena Maha, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Shimate Bhakti Vedanta Samanita Namane, Namaste, Sarasati Deve, Gaurabhani Pacharine, Nirvase Sasunyavadi, Pastatya De Shatarine, Jayasi Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadhar, Shiva Sari Gaurabhakta Vindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, <clears throat> I was invited to, to give this Bhagavad Gita wisdom from the Bhagavad Gita, and I do believe it's monthly. Is that true, Sarva and Guru Bhakti? It's a monthly, first, the first Friday of the month from now on, until Krishna willing, Krishna Krishna willing. And I'd like to do different sections of the Gita. And I thought, what a better place to start than at the beginning. And um, we all know that the beginning chapters is observing the armies. <laughs> and actually, the first verse um, of the first chapter, there's a very significant um, point that Srila Prabhupada brings up which I've explained many, many times. And this, this program ends at eight o'clock, right? Yeah, eight o'clock, timely, okay. So the, the battle, the, the, the Bhagavad Gita begins with, um, oh wow, look at that, some of my friends coming from, yeah, look at that, hi, wow. Well. So, Jitarasa wanted to know what was going on when his sons and the sons of Pandu got together at Kurukshetra. And Prabhupada writes in the purport that um, the Bhagavad Gita is a widely read theistic science summarized in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, the Gita Mahatmya. And there it says that one should read Bhagavad Gita very scrutinizingly with the help of a person who is a devotee of Krishna and under and try to understand it without personal motivation and interpret or interpretations. And the example of the, of the clear understanding of the Gita is in the Gita itself, by the way it was understood by Arjuna, who heard the Gita directly from Lord Krishna. And so this is how we are studying Bhagavad Gita. We want to do this uh, very scrutinizingly um, with the help of Srila Prabhupada's purports. And I also have several commentaries on the Gita that I will refer to um, by devotees uh, in ISKCON and also by the previous acharyas that have uh, laid down the, um, that actually did all the legwork. They did everything for us to establish this. So the beginning chapter, um, basically, again, it just lying down, it's laying down the, the uh, framework for what, what's been going on in, in, at this point. And so Arjun, he, he finally decides that he wants to see who is ready to fight this battle. Um, the, the, the armies have already assembled, everything is set to go, and he wants to, he wants to see who is there to fight this battle. And he addresses Krishna as a chuta, infallible. Because Arjuna, Krishna had decided to take up the service to Arjuna, I guess we can say, as, as a chariot driver. He's known as part of the Sarth. Uh, he's a, a chariot driver. So we all know that the driver, especially if you've ever been to India, which many of you have, uh, they say, driver, hey. In other words, hey, driver, hey, driver. Take me here, take me there. And so this is exactly what Arjun did. He said, oh, my dear Krishna, oh, Chuta, infallible one. Infallible means that even though Arjun is 
the chariot driver, therefore he is the one giving the orders. Krishna is the actual infallible one in this, uh, in this drama. I guess you could call it this, the staging of the battlefield of Kurukshetra. And he wants to see who is present. And so he sees, uh, the, as it's described in the Gita, Arjun, uh, Krishna tells Arjun, just see Bhishma, I mean, uh, it, just see Bhishma and Drona and all the crew is assembled here. So it's right in front of his spiritual master, his martial arts, uh, uh, Dronacharya, and his grandfather. And he's saying, this is whom you must contend this great trial of arms with. And so Arjun, he has several dilemmas and he's trying to figure out what, what he's meant to do. And this is, this is a common question I get from devotees. What is my dharma? What is my what what am what is my occupational duty? What am I meant to do in this lifetime? And so this Bhagavad Gita unfolds that question, and it unfolds it by discussing the nature of the soul, the nature of the material energy, um, the nature of what the aspects of God, uh, how time influences us. There's so many different aspects to the Gita, and we'll we'll touch on many of them over the. Uh, of course, of the, um, the reading from the Bhagavad Gita. And so through that discussion, Arjun was trying to find some material sol uh, solace to the situation. And he's literally telling Krishna that um, he, want, he has like, this compassionate heart. And Prabhupada even brings out that, that, that all this was due to uh, Arjun being a great devotee of the Lord. All these symptoms that he's experiencing, um, compassion, um, trying to enjoy material energy, or trying to enjoy or seeing that the, the, the trying to enjoy a kingdom at the cost of the lives of so many millions of people, or the destruction of the family, or the fear of sinful reactions, or even his own indecision as to whether or not he should it'd be better for him to win the battle or not win the battle. Why would he want to even win it if all those who he cares, cares for will be vanquished on this battle? And so he has basically five, five uh, what would you say, challenges, I guess is the word we use these days. He has five challenges uh, before him. And the compassion that Arjun has is very, it's very deep compassion. It's a type of compassion that he has, um, he's being faced with to kill his relatives, actually be in battle with his relatives. And a little lower than that is his desire, it's like a less noble reason because Arjun knows it will be impossible for him to enjoy the kingdom if he wins because everybody that he wants to, wants, would want to share that kingdom with is on that battle. And so he can understand that there'll be so much disruption, a nobility to enjoy, even if he wins. He says, even if I win an unrivaled king kingdom, like in the, like in the he have an opulence like the heaven, I won't be happy. And so one of the things that he brings up also is the destruction of the family, which is one of the main points of that first chapter because with the death of so many uh, great Chetrias, the Chetrias are meant to lead. Uh, the Chetriyas of the former days were known as Rajarshis. They were uh, saintly kings, Rishi and Raja, Rajarshis, they were saintly kings. And they led the people to not only for material, what would you say, it won't say prosperity, but material satisfaction, but also to understand their spiritual position it, in, while, while at the same time engaging in the process of living their regular lives. And he wanted to make sure that unscrupulous men wouldn't take advantage of the women, the women class and create a sense of un, unwanted population within the world. Uh, it's known as Varna Sankara or unwanted population. Uh, Prabhupada spoke on this many times. Uh, the need for uh, good progeny, good, good children, producing good children, uh, not, not, you know, to, to raising them in, in the spirit of Krishna consciousness or God consciousness. 
at least like Srila Prabhupada said, if your children cannot become pure devotees, at least they should at least be general ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and we can see nowadays that this is uh, very, 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 very far from the mark uh, for having, uh, what would you say, producing children with a rigid, religious intent to uh, allow them to become liberated in this lifetime. And Arjun is also fearful of sinful reactions. He thinks that at the enjoyment of, of royal happiness on his side, winning the battle, getting some royal happiness is not worth the suffering he'll have to undergo by killing so many, so many, uh, what would you say, family members, even his superiors. Imagine having to come in front of your own guru Maharaj and say, let's go to battle. You know, you're, 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 on the, you're on the other side or your grandfather. I mean, I had a grandfather I was very affectionate towards, and I can't imagine being in that position. And so our Jim was very much, um, I would say, concerned with the sinful reactions that would happen because of this. So he's concerned about his, his self and his reaction. He's not thinking of Krishna. As Prabhupada is saying, that many times he's, he's thinking of his social you know, situation and different things like that and not putting Krishna first. He's thinking of the political, social situation, I think is the words Prabhupada uses, rather than putting Krishna's interest first. And finally, Arjuna is facing the great in, a great indecision because he's not convinced that conquering the other, the Korvas will be in his best interest. Um, as I described that he said it would, he would, he would, there wouldn't even desire a flourishing kingdom like the demigods in heaven, what to speak of along this earthly planet. And so we can see that this is this is Arjun's dilemma. <clears throat> and in the sex, so what I what I showed was the second the beginning of the second chapter. And all these different things are described. Um, what I've just uh, described here is given by his race Burjan Prabhu in his uh, comment in his overview of Bhagavad Gita entitled Surrender Unto Me. Because he synthesizes that first chapter because it just lists of, um, a lot of names about people on the battlefield, the names of the uh, Ananta Vijay, the, the, the uh, Bhimas, Kangsha, Bhagavad and you know, the Sangos, the Mani Pushpaka, the different uh, Kangshas, and Nakula, and, and Sahadev. So there's so many little details in that chapter. But what happens is that um, Krishna, Arjun decides that I'm not going to fight. I'm, I'm just, I'm not gonna fight this battle. He said that having thus spoken on the battlefield, Arjun cast aside his bow and arrow and sat down in the, in the chariot, his mind overwhelmed with grief. And the first chapter, the second chapter begins with uh, Sanjaya saying that Arjun full of compassion and his mind depressed, his eyes full of tear, Krishna spoke. And Krishna tells him that this, this kind of behavior that you're engaged in now, this, this weakness of heart, there's one place in the Gita where Prabhupada is explaining this weakness of heart is one of the prime reasons for us not to uh, surrender unto the Lord or to follow our, the inner direction that is given to us by the Lord. And it, it doesn't behoove one. So Krishna is going through this and explaining to Arjun all these different situations. So Arjun is explaining to Krishna that would you kill your would you kill your girl Sanjivani Muni? Would you kill your grandpa? Would you do the same thing you're asking me to do? And again, he does. He's he comes to that point where he doesn't know which is better for him. He, he does, I'm, no, I, I don't know. He said, I've gone through so many different things. And it's like, uh, there's, a, there's a statement that he goes through Shastra, he goes through, he quotes saintly people, he quotes so many different things as part of his arguments, but he's not finding satisfaction in his, in his, in his own intelligence and in his ability to solve the problem. And that's the verse that I chose for tonight, which is text number seven of this Bhagavad Gita, second chapter, if you have a Bhagavad Gita with you. And uh, I guess if you want, Sri Rupa Manjari, you could 
I'll post that second uh, second chapter, verse number seven. And what we'll do is we'll go through this like we normally do on my Tuesday class, which is also in Houston. <laughs> or actually, I'm in Dallas, but it can be anywhere in the world nowadays. And so um, I don't know if you're running the... Uh, okay, yeah, okay, here's your sheet. Because I saw, I saw um, uh, Winston on there at the beginning. So uh, the verse is Karpanya Dosha Pahada Sabhava Pichami Tam Dharma Samuda Jeta Yatshaya Chan Ushi Tam Ruhi Tam Me Shishya Teham Siddhi Man Tam Papanam. That Sorry about that. I wouldn't normally do that, but the anthem we wanted something nice for lunch. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so what some kind of swam I am. I get I stopped the volume of the other class to confirm my lunch. So anyway, this verse is like Arjuna is explaining. Now I am confused about my duty and have lost all composure due to because of miserly weakness. There's that weakness coming in again. In this condition, I'm asking you to tell me for certain what is best for me. Now I am your disciple and a soul surrendered unto you. Please instruct me. So this is the point where Arjun surrenders to Krishna. And yeah, okay. Where Arjun surrenders to Krishna. And We'll have, I'll ask some of our teachers and students that are present, oops, what's going on? To read, we use, uh, Smith is one of our main readers on Tuesday. And so um, I think we caught, get everybody up to date where we're at in the Gita, because this is the beginning of the instructions where Arjun surrenders to Krishna and Krishna begins to instruct him. Uh, although he's already told him that you know, this, this is in behold a person of your nature, your status, your chatriya, your, your warrior. You're not meant to have this weakness of heart. As Arjuna is saying, that because of misery, weakness, he's, he's actually recognizing his position. So, Smitha, would you like to read the first paragraph? And then we'll go for some reflections, uh, feedback, or questions from the first, from the, from the um, what you say, uh, First and first paragraph of the first book. Sure, Raj, thank you. By nature's own way, the complete system of material activities is a source of perplexity for everyone. In every step, there is perplexity, and therefore it behooves one to approach a bona fide spiritual master who can give one proper guidance for executing the purpose of life. All Vedic literatures advise us to approach a bona fide spiritual master to get free from the perplexities of life, which happen without our desire. They are like a forest fire that somehow blazes without being set by anyone. Similarly, the world situation is such that perplexities of life automatically appear without our wanting such confusion. No one wants fire, and yet it takes place, and we become perplexed. The Vedic wisdom therefore advises that in order to solve the perplexities of life, and to understand the science of the solution, one must approach a spiritual master who is in disciplic succession. A person with a bona fide spiritual master is supposed to know everything. One should not, therefore, remain in material perplexities, but should approach a spiritual master. This is the purport of this verse. So some reflections from this. Some reflections from this verse and purport. Anybody? And Smith, I you just spoke. That's why you're a bit out. Some questions, some reflections. I mean, there was a lot there for me because we can see um, by nature's own way, complete, the complete system of material activities is a source of perplexities for everyone. Please feel it, feel it, feel it. Oh, okay. Every, everyone has this, everyone experiences this. So I do this, so I do that, so I do this, so I do that. And every, my experience is every single person undergoes this type of 
uh, quandary, where we want to know what is to be done and what is not to be done. Or should I do this or should I not do this? There's so many different aspects to this. And so Prabhupada says here, in every step there is perplexity. And therefore, it behooves one to approach a bona fide spiritual master who can give one proper guidance for executing the purpose of life. It doesn't say for making one happy in life or materially happy in life. It says to make one uh, understand the guidance for executing the, the, the purpose of life. So who, who knows what the purpose of life is? What's the purpose of life? I Good. see some of my friends on here. I could ask them to speak out. Uh, Kavir, what is the purpose? To get Krishna Pam, to surrender to Krishna and uh, establish our lost relationship with him. Yeah, establish our lost relationship with Krishna. So that's the purpose of the life. How do we do that? According to this verse, how do we do that? Approaching spiritual so, yes, uh, uh uh, uh, what was I going to say, Jivan? Did you did you have an answer? Oh, I thought he I thought he raised his hand because he had an answer to my question. Okay, it's okay, Jivan. That's cool. I'm, it's good you raised your hand, and it's cool that you raised your hand. But it's okay if you don't have uh, anything to say too. That's cool. So again, Kuvera is is according to this verse. How do how do we how do we understand how do we execute the purpose of life? To approach a spiritual master and follow policy instructions. Yeah. Now, how do you let, let's get let's get into that a little bit because um, Arjuna in the next verse will say, "I find no means to drive away this grief which is drying up my senses. I will not be able to spell it even if I win a prosperous, unrivaled kingdom on earth like sovereignty, like the demigods in heaven." So he's saying that here's here here's here's my problem. I I I I I I don't know how to get rid of my my emotional situation right now. I'm grieving. Everyone in this world grieves. Arjuna is grieving the foreseen death of his of his family members. And therefore, in the next verse, he says to um, to Krishna, he says that having whoops, whoops I missed the verse. So the night and nine, it says that uh, Arjun chastises the enemies. O oh, Krishna, Govinda, I shall not fight. Mm -hmm. so in, in the verse we're studying tonight, he's saying, I'm a soul surrendered unto you. I'm a soul surrendered unto you. Please instruct me. I'm asking you to tell me what is best for me. But let me tell you the criteria. I can't be happy even if I win the kingdom. I can't be happy if I get a life like the demigods in heaven. And I'm not going to do what you say. I'm not going to fight. Now, how many of you have disciples like that? <laughs> <laughs> in other words, like they, they say, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm surrendering unto you. I want, you to, I, want, I, want, I want to be your disciple. But... I'm not going to do what you just told me to do. But that, that's the purpose for what we're, we, we approach a spiritual master is to get the instructions. Mm -hmm. But if we're not willing to accept the instructions, right? So then Krishna tells Arjuna, and later on we'll get into it, Asochan Andasochas Trampagnam Bedan Shabasa say, Arjuna, you're speaking learning words, but actually you're a fool, number one, because you're grieving for something which is not worthy of grief. Uh, this body is not worth grieving over because you can't stop the death of your family members by not fighting. They're going to they're gonna eventually leave this world anyway. So actually, our Krishna tells our dreams to actually be happy to get, get, get them some nice young bodies rather than the old ones are residing in now. So all the Vedic literature advises that we need a spiritual master uh, to solve the perplexities of life. And I brought this up so many times that every single, I would say every single aspect of 
most aspects of our life, we have a teacher. I'm sure everyone here, you know, had you know some type of parental guidance or what do you call it? Parental or what do you call those people that take care of kids that aren't their parents? There's a word for that. Um, authorized authorized caregiver, whatever it is. And so in other words, the, the, the parents, they teach, they even teach the kids how to brush their teeth. They teach the kids how to bathe. They teach the kids how to eat. They teach them. Everything is taught in the beginning of our life. We go to school to learn. We have a teacher. We're, we're taught everything that we need to know. And so when it comes to, when it comes to a spiritual life, why do we think that we should be able to do it on our own without any assistance? Why, why, would be the, why is the most important thing of our life taking direction and guidance from a teacher who actually understands the purpose of life through the specific succession as Prophet says here. One should approach a bona fide man, spiritual master that is in, in the line of specific succession. So this is what we're asking here. This is what we're asking here. So some reflections, some feedback. Sarva. If we don't follow uh, our mind, we, I mean, we have to follow something more reliable than our mind, it seems like. If you don't follow your mind, what? You got to speak mind up, is, sir. You got to put some potency in there. Our mind is not reliable, so I think we all make mistakes. We have so many imperfections, so it seems like we do need a, a guide. Yes, it does. Yeah, this it does seem that way. Some other reflections, thoughts, comments, questions. This is meant to be interactive. This is not a spectator sport. This is a participatory sport. What do you say? This is an on the court sport. Well, I can start so, asking uh, questions. In the 1960s, there was a saying, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the perplexities, so the perplexities of life, they happen without us wanting them. What is the example Prophet uses in the purport to, to explain that? What is that? What is the example he uses in the purport to explain that? Does anybody have a Bhagavad Gita with them? Like a forest fire, Maharaj? Yeah, it's like a forest fire. Who said that? Shri Rupa. Oh, Shri Rupa over there. Okay, I could I didn't see the level light come on. Yeah, he said like a forest, like a fire that a, that blazes without being set by anyone. I would give the example of bamboo uh, rubbing up against each other and creating friction and causing and causing uh, and causing um, a fire to take place, even without us wanting it. And so we we have these things in our lives that we that come upon us very very naturally. Um, I know we have a few doctors online here tonight, and they're not giving free advice for the rest of us who aren't doctors. But we have online online doctors here tonight, and I guess we could ask them. I mean, I'm sure they would say that nobody's ever came to them and asked for a disease. Yet disease comes. The people come and they, and they ask, you know, give me some kind of happiness. We strive for happiness, but we strive to not to not be to be. I guess is I'm not be unhappy. Is that a double meaning? You know, I, I just want to get caught proper in proper English. So we 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 try, we strive not to have distress in our life, but it comes automatic, even though we're trying not to have it, it comes automatically. So why wouldn't our, so our material situation happen automatically also? 
as long as we're doing our duty according to our occupation, according to our varna and ashram, then why wouldn't they automatically come? We never search for the unpleasantries, but yet they come. So Prabhupada is, the, this verse is explaining to us that there's no real material solution to our unhappiness in this world. There's no real material solution to the uh, different types of suffering. Does anybody know the three types of sufferings in this world? Raise your hand. Everybody should have their hand up. This is, this is, this is I'm starting to feel like a dictator. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sabra Bama. Yeah. Um, let's let you spoke. Are they, give me one, Sabra, because they got some hands up there. Give me one of your. Adi Atme. Adi Atme. Okay. Nilam. Here, uh, I don't know who that is, what his devotee name is, Nilam? Yes, uh, all obeisance to, to Guru Maharaj. Um, my answer is the three ones are Adi Davik, Adi Bhatik, and Adi Dhyatmik. Yes, Adi Atmik, Adi Bhatik, and Adi Davik. Adi Atmik means sufferings due to our own bodies and minds. Has anyone ever experienced sufferings due to their body and mind? <laughs> Thank you, Guru Bhakti, for raising your hand. And she's a doctor. <laughs> Bhagavan Narda, is you raising your hand for a, a comment here? Are you raising your hand because you've experienced that? <laughs> I've experienced that. Okay. <laughs> Adi Bhotik, misery caused by other living entities. Anybody? Misery is caused by other people's bodies and minds. Anybody experience that? What can you do? Any Adi, Adi Daivik, uh, natural disturbances. Just like yesterday, it rained and then it rained ice and then it rained, then it, it doesn't rain snow, then it, then it snowed. And so the road was covered with ice and it was covered with snow and nobody could go anywhere. So Adi Atme, Adi Daivi, Adi Bhoti. All these three things. Up there, like, they're like three. They can probably say that one is being afflicted by at least one of these, if not all, at all times. We have to be under the influence of these things at every moment. So the, the Vedic wisdom advises us in order to solve the perplexities of life, one must approach a spiritual master who's in the disciplic succession. Why is it that one has to be in the disciplic succession? Why is that, why is that stated so often? May I call on people by name if I don't see any hands? I know some people have the answer to this. So. Raise your hands. I know you know it. Oh, oh, be more. Okay. Yes, to get the right knowledge. So, from through the disciplic succession. Yeah, but why do we need disciplic success? Why does the spiritual master have to come in disciplic succession? Why mm -hmm. is it? Why is it necessary? Why? What? 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 What is the? What is it? what is the why is it part of the criteria? Mm -hmm. I drew back to you, had your hand up, so we'll let you take her. Um, just when we um, when we get an education, we go to an accredited school, or if we buy something, we go to a trusted brand, so we are not cheated. Yes, yes, very good. Continue, keep going. <laughs> so. Um, because if we just do the, 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 what should we say, the nature of the living entity that he has a tendency to cheat and has imperfect senses and mm. can be, and all those things lead us to probably choices. So the disciplic succession is already wetted for us. And if it comes directly to Krishna, so we can be assured that the path is, is uh, the correct one. Very good. 
So how do we know if someone may be part of a disciplic succession? What is what is the what what is the qualification for that person to hold that post of teacher? What is the qualification? One of the qualifications is that they're part of that disciplic succession. One of the qualifications is that they come in a line of teachers that have, um, when you say, uh, proven record. Mm -hmm. Just like they, what, what do they call that thing? Like on uh, when when you get so many stars, if you have a company, like maybe your maybe your office, your, your office. If I may use you as an example, because you're no longer uh, mm -hmm. uh, in that office anymore, so it's not a traumatic experience for me talking about it. So, so. They, what do they call that thing where they rate you? There's some kind of thing where you get five stars or four stars. Um, somebody help me here. An evaluation? Yeah, it's an evaluation, but they, they have a name for it. It's somebody, somebody, gives, give, like somebody gives you five stars, four stars. They have a it, name for it because you review? see it. The review customer, is a customer review. review. Yeah, customer, customer review. Yeah, customer review. They have some kind of name behind it. I can't remember. I, I see it when I go on Amazon. <laughs> It'll like say satisfaction. Yeah, what? It, yeah, I, we understand what it is. Five stars. So when one of the one of the criteria for being in the district of success, being a, a, a bona fide teacher, just like a bona fide doctor goes to a bona fide medical school, a bona, you know, a bona fide teacher goes to a bona fide educational institution. And you don't, and you can't, you, just like you, they subscribe, oops, I'm going to go over time, oh man, just like um, the, um, probably would say that you have to go to a medical school to become a medical doctor. You can go to the library and get all the books that every medical doctor reads, and you can read all the medical books, and you can have all the medical knowledge from the books. But if you don't, if you're not connected to a medical institution, you'll never get a medical license. And so this is, that's, that's the point that Guru Bhakti was, was bringing forward, that we have that connection, that, that, that authorization through that connection to, to be part of that specific succession. Some takeaways, some more feedback, some more thoughts. Okay. So we'll go for our next. We'll follow the other. Say, say it again, be more. Yeah, uh, who follow the authorized scripture and the Guru Parampara system. Yeah, there's three, there's three things, right? Guru, Shastra, Shastra and Shastra, Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. Yeah, Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. They all line up. Then we know that we, if they, if if the Guru tells you something that's not in Shastra or backed up by the sages, etc., like that, we understand that we're not in the right, we're not in the right place. So, can we call on someone to read? The next paragraph, unless there's any further questions or comments. Do we have any expert readers in here that are? I'm looking at one little one. I thought maybe would volunteer. Okay, cool. Uh, we'll call. We'll call on. Uh, yeah. I, I was going to call on uh, she ripped my sorry, but I see her coughing into her elbow. <laughs> Usually, I've got teachers and the students. <laughs> I can. I can okay, go ahead. Who is the man in material perplexity? It is the who does not understand the problems of life. In Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad. The perplexed man is described as follows. Yova etat aksharam gargi avidvat, it's not clear. Avidvamat lokat pratisa kripanaha 
-hmm. He is miserly. He is a miserly man who does not solve the problems of life as a human and who thus quits the, this world like cats and dogs without understanding the science of self-realization. This human form of life is a most valuable asset for the living entity who can utilize it for solving the problems of life. Therefore, one who does not utilize this opportunity properly is a miser. On the other hand, there is the Brahman, or he who is intelligent enough to utilize this body to solve all the problems of life. Ya etat aksharam gargi viditvat mati lokat paraiti sa brahmanaha. Yeah, very good. Sorry, I. No, very good, very good. It's, if you try, that's, you know, Sanskrit, I know, English is a second language for me. I speak American. And so the idea is if, if we just try it, it's, we get deeper. And Krishna probably always liked it when we recited the verses in the Bhagavatam. So who is the man in material perplexities? Somebody tell me who that is. I see some of my friends here. I'm going to start calling on their names because I'm not raising my hand. Who's miserly? Miserly, yes. Yeah. So who's no? Who is who is the man in material perplexities? Mm. Who's the man in material perplexities? Mm. It is he who does not understand the problems of life. Mm. We don't even understand the problems of life. What do you, most people think the problems of life are get my kid into a good school, you know, get this to this, get a good job, get, you know, early retirement, good benefits, uh, economy being good. What are the real problems of life? Does anybody know what the real problems of life? Besides those who have already answered, we're going to call in some new ones. Give me some problems of life. But what Prabhupada would say are the problems of life. Birth, death, old age, and disease. Birth, death, old age, and disease. There you go. Jamra, Mritya, Jara, Badhi. Birth, death, old age, and disease. These are the real problems of life. If we can solve these problems, but, but miserly people, they're so busy, engaged in extracurricular activities just like I know when you go to, when you go to high school you, you have your main courses that you have to take and then you can take extracurricular activities you can have some like courses that aren't focused on your main subjects but if you don't do the main subjects then all, all your education on the other side has very little value have to learn have to learn the proper aspects of life. So some feedback, some some reflections on this part of the work. Can you imagine going around and telling people that they're not solving the perplexities of their life? They're like a hog or a dog, cats and dogs. Why does Papa say they're like cats and dogs? Mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm waving at one of the kids that was waving. Go ahead, Kubera. It's bedtime, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm the cat thinks he sees a cat and dog thinks he's a dog. Yeah. So why 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 does Papa compare him to what, these be people to cats and dogs? You know, the, the human human being thing is a body. He's comparing yeah. the Bodily complete. Uh, body. Mm. Nilam. Uh, because all animals, like cats and dogs, they do not have intelligence like human beings. Yeah. Without understanding the science of self realization, is, is the quote in the book. 
this human form of life is a most valuable asset for the living entity. Most valuable asset. The intelligence that yeah. to, to know what is right and what is wrong. Mm. Or to know what is material and what is spiritual. What is nitya, what is anitya. What is yes. permanent, what is uh, perishable. So when we yes. understand the difference of these things, that means, yes, we have intelligence. A spiritual intelligence. We have material intelligence. What, what? Have we with, what, have we, what, what have we done with our material intelligence? We've invented the atomic bomb, only increasing the, the, the expediency of death, probably, would say, in the 16th chapter. Right. Can I, can I, uh, yes. Okay, I see a lot of hands up. Bimara. Yeah. If I'm saying that improperly, so tell me, is it, 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 it Bimara? Yes. Uh, is a, in, uh, every living being, uh, eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, but the uh, human being has the intelligent mind. They can uh, think, they can uh, uh, do uh, uh, good intelligent uh, activities, you know, and they can... Uh, respond you know question answer reading uh, under try to understand the scriptures and they make their goal of life to be uh, worship the supreme lord and become with the supreme lord one day so this is what uh, human form of life uh, we can do that and worship the supreme lord well, if we don't do that then we're a miser and if we do do that then we're a brahmana So I'll read the last paragraph myself. Creepiness or miserly persons waste their time in being overly excellent for family, society, country, etc., in the material conception of life. One is often attached to family life, namely to wife, children, and other members on the basis of skin disease. The creepina thinks that he is able to protect his family members from death or thinks that he's able to, oops, or, th or the, or the creepiness thinks that his family or society can save him from the verge of death. Such family attachment can be found in more animals to take care of children also. Being intelligent, Arjuna can understand that his affection for family members and his wish to protect them from death were the causes of his propensities. Although he could understand that his duty was to fight, was awaiting him, still, on account of miserly weakness, he could miss, not discharge the, uh, the duties. He is therefore asking Lord Krishna, the Supreme Spiritual Master, to make a definite solution. He offers himself to Krishna as a disciple. He wants to stop friendly talks. Talks between the Master and the disciple are serious. Now Arjun wants to talk very seriously before the recognized spiritual master. Krishna is therefore the original spiritual master of the science of Bhagavad Gita. And Arjun is the first disciple for understanding the Gita. How Arjun understands the Bhagavad Gita is standard, is stated in the Gita itself. And yet foolish mundane scholars explain that one need not submit to Krishna as a person, but the unborn with Krishna. There is no difference between Krishna's within and without. One who has no sense of this understanding is the greatest fool in trying to understand Bhagavad Gita. Some thoughts, some reflections. So miserly. I think Ashina is giving good example that if we are in perplexity, we should approach a spiritual master to to help perplexity. That's Bhagavan Narada. He's always got. 
Um, I was reflecting a little bit. Like, I think immediately I was thinking it's healthy to be fearful in one sense, or at least to acknowledge it. But at the same time, we should overcome that fear. Like, I feel a lot of the times when I have my doubts or my uncertainties, it adds more pressure to my practice. And then I'm not able to perform as strongly as I would like, you know? So I think by acknowledging it and analyzing it without getting too mental or overwhelmed by it, and just knowing that it's going to come and go, these things are there. And it's, it's just like what we're stuck with. It kind of allows me to just, I don't know, I guess kind of accept it and move on and be more detached from it rather than to kind of like negate from it. Then I find like that's when the pressure comes, if that makes any sense. So you're thinking yeah. about Juno. I don't know, comments, Maharaj. I was trying to unpack it as best as I could. Very good. But what was your, you said fear is good. Which, which, which type of fear are you referring to? I guess in one sense, like not knowing what's going to happen, right? We're not in control of the results mm -hmm. of our activities. And that's like very intense to kind of get through, you know, I've been trying to control things for 38 years and mm -hmm. to just read and then to say, okay, well, I'm not the controller. I'm not the body. It's like, you know, as we have this Sangha online or as we come together, you know, it's a, it's a nice reminder, but just coming to grips in terms personally with understanding that I have that conditioning and it's scary for me, you know, but at the same time, I just accept it. And I, I have some sort of a counterbalance knowing that as I'm having Sangha or as I'm trying to perform some sort of service to other people that will counteract that you know yeah seva is always nice very nice some other thoughts or reflections in regard to your point uh, bhagavan Marga was there's a verse in the i believe it's the 13th chapter 8 to 12 what is to be feared and what is not to be um, how, to, how to deal with that. And I was listening to a lecture, it came up, this lecture came up two or three times in the last four or five months in my car and in, in, on my lunch, lunch lecture. I probably was explaining how we don't work, we, we think we're enjoying, but we're not actually enjoying. And there's no way for us to actually enjoy in the material world. Only, only, the, only we think we're enjoying. The mind thinks that we're enjoying, but that enjoyment's not really there. Probably, I think I mentioned this on my Tuesday class recently. We probably said just like if, if you put a, a cloth on your tongue, like a tongue mitten, and uh, I think probably said you take one nice rasgul, but you won't be able to taste it. Come in. You won't be. You won't be able. You won't be able to taste it. Come on in, Dasha. And in the same way, because we're now covered by the modes of material nature, we're actually covered by goodness, passion, and ignorance. We think we're enjoying, and our mind, but it's only our minds telling us that we're actually enjoying. But there's really no enjoyment in this material world. The real enjoyment only comes on the spiritual platform when the senses are actually free to the three modes of material nature. They're no longer covered by these modes of material nature. And we're no longer under the influence of a hunkar, the false identification with this material body, that we can actually come to the point of uh, true satisfaction and actually enjoying on a spiritual level. That's where enjoyment actually is. There's no, I would say, no material, no material enjoyment. There's no enjoyment in the material world, which is kind of a, a, a strong statement. Thank you, Narada Bhagavan. Very good. And also, I, I always like Narada Bhagavan because he always puts it in first person. He always speaks of himself. He uses himself as an example. So now we're at 
we're at two minutes to closing time. So I'm, we can wrap this up that Arjun was perplexed and he had certain perplexities. Um, he was, um, he was feeling some compassion for his relatives. He was um, trying to uh, see how he could, how, how by not fighting the battle, he could, he could, would be more enjoyable for him. Um, he was worried about the destruction of the family. He was fearful of sinful reactions and he was unsure or confused of whether uh, deciding whether it was better for him to win or lose. And therefore, when he was in that state of confusion, in that state of, of, of as if he said, here, confu I know I'm confused about my duty. Uh, and therefore, we ask the spiritual master, because our real main duty, the real main duty is to engage in the devotional service of the Lord. That is our main and prime duty. And we do that through the bionadia of the spiritual master. So Sri Rupa, Manjari, Devi Dasi. Thank you so much. If anybody has any questions, comments, or appreciations, please feel free to unmute before, before we let Maharaj go for the evening. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you back each month. So yeah, yeah. nice to be here. I see Thanks some of my I saw some of my friends like Jeevan. Of course, I don't see him now. I think he's probably gone to bed. Priya, or just some of the mainstays of my life. Many others. Yeah.